Hey, good morning, church. Let's all stand together. It's great to see you guys today. Let's just lift our voice to the Lord and sing to Him. Make a joyful noise to Him together. Let's clap our hands. today to gather together, to set aside some time, to dedicate some time uh, just to looking to the Lord and adoring Him and bringing our worship to Him and seeking His face. And uh, I hope you guys are enjoying a wonderful Christmas season so far. And, you know, for our church uh, here at Calvary, the, the vision of our church, you, you've heard it many times probably, it's, it's Jesus famous, simply Jesus famous. Our desire is to see Jesus famous in, in each of our hearts, individually, throughout our church family, and for that to just to spread and, and to go throughout our community as well. And, and the, the reason for that is because Jesus is our Savior. He is our hope. He is our Redeemer. And so we want to make much of Him and for Him to be just so big and so uh, just at the forefront of our sight as we look ahead. And, you know, during the Christmas season, uh, this is a chance, you know, all year long we, we celebrate and worship and talk about 
about Jesus Christ, but during the Christmas time, this is a chance to kind of look a little bit more closely, specifically at the, the birth of Jesus, the incarnation, God becoming man, the Word made flesh, dwelling among us. And so uh, this morning we're going to sing uh, this next song, just celebrating and declaring uh, just this wonderful thing of, of Jesus being born and coming to earth. So let's just exalt him and magnify him together as we sing.
Father, we, we reach out to you this morning. Lord, we are only able to do that because you first have reached out to us and gathered us to yourself and covered us with your protection. And Lord, the salvation you have given as a free gift and as we sing of your, your goodness and Lord, how you are holding us. I just, I think of the, the lyrics from that, that hymn, that prayer, God, that you would, you would bring quickly the day when, when what we are believing in faith, we would be able to see it. And Lord, that the skies would open and Lord, you would return uh, triumphantly to receive your bride to yourself and to redeem us and to make us whole once and for all. Lord, this morning we just look forward to that day, especially this time of year as we're thinking about the birth of Jesus Christ. Lord, we can't help but think of, of your return one day. And Lord, what a, what a glorious day that will be. Uh, so Lord, we, we eagerly wait for that and pray for that and ask for that, Lord, for you, for you to come. Lord, we're, we're waiting for you, we're thinking of you, we're rejoicing in you this morning. Uh, it's such a gift to be able to, to gather and to set our hearts towards you today. Just ask your blessing on this time. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Uh, uh, we're going to take a moment in our time together to, to give to the Lord our tithes, our offerings to him. This is another way that we get to worship, another way that we get to just pour ourselves out before the Lord, admitting that, that all we have is a, is a gift from God, and, and it's our just our joy, our pleasure to give to Him. So our ushers will come in just a moment, but we're just going to continue to sing and just encourage you, continue to, to press into the Lord during this time. Lift your voice to Him this morning.
us, Lord. We thank you for that truth that you are God with us. Lord, you have not separated yourself. You have not left us alone, but Lord, you have made a way that we could be united with you through your son, Jesus Christ. You are Emmanuel, God with us. We just rejoice in that and declare that and celebrate that this morning as such a powerful and incredible thing that we get to receive and enjoy as, as your children, as your people, as those you have called yourself. And so, Lord, we, we do just rejoice in that today. We lift you up. We exalt your name this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Before we continue, why don't you say hello to someone nearby for just a moment. Greet someone next to you. Greetings, church. Merry Christmas. It is so good to see all of you here. I don't know about you. I love coming to church and seeing it decorated for Christmas. I'm one of those people that needs two months of Christmas decoration, so my house has been decked for a month now. But my name's Bree. It is so good to see all of you. I've called um, Calvary Monterey my church home for a little over three years. Um, but if it is your first time here at Calvary, I would love on just behalf of everyone here at our church to say welcome because we're so glad that you're here. If it's your first day, we'd also like to ask you to stop by the Welcome Center on your way out. You'll find it on your right-hand side before you step outside. And um, there'll be some friendly faces there that would love to get to know you, put a little welcome gift in your hand, and um, possibly let you know about some of the things going on here at our church that would be of interest to you. And this morning, I have just a few announcements for you before we get into the word. And the first is about our life groups. So life groups here at Calvary are just the way that we do small groups. We break out of the large church gathering and into homes and places to get in the word with other believers um, just in a small group setting. And it's, it's really been an awesome season, I know, for my group and for many others. Um, but sadly, all good things have to come to an end. And so this week is the last week of life groups. This is where all of you guys say, oh, right? Okay. I know you've enjoyed life groups. Um, some of your groups will be having special gatherings, being that it's the last week. And so your leader, your leader will have more information for you on that. If you missed out on life groups this time around, that's okay, because signups will begin again in February. So you can kind of have that on your radar. Um, and again, we just really believe that it is an important part of church community and a fellowship to get together and actually get to know the people you sit beside here on Sundays. And so um, next is an announcement about our Christmas Eve services. So we're so excited that um, Christmas Eve happens to fall on Sunday this year. And we're going to be having four services here at Calvary Monterey, 12 to... Yeah, 12 to 4 and 6 p.m. Um, these are going to be family-style services, which really just means bring the kiddos with you. Christmas is just such a wonderful time to just worship and celebrate Jesus with our little ones. And so bring them into service with you. We'll have our children's choir performing. Um, there will actually be a Christmas photo booth that you and your friends and family can take advantage of. And then our grill will be doing a special Christmas dinner starting at 1 o'clock after that first 12 o'clock service. And so we just really encourage 
encourage and invite you and your families to come out and enjoy that. Invite your friends, your neighbors, and the people that God has placed in your life. Christmas is an awesome opportunity to invite those around you to come and experience your church home here at Calvary Monterey. Also, in the way of Christmas, um, last week we began um, our annual ornament um, drive, you could call it. And I love this church for so many reasons. But, man, this church shows up when there is a need. And praise God, all 150 ornaments were picked up last Sunday. You can clap for that. That's awesome. So thank you to those of you that chose to take an ornament and um, just to bless a young one at this Christmas season. Um, A reminder is that those gifts are due back next Sunday. You can bring them by the Welcome Center, and there are instructions on that ornament that you can follow for um, what is asked of that. And if you missed out, there actually are some ornaments for our Cherish Center um, foster ministry that we have. Um, And the Cherish Center is a place that helps children through that transition time as they are actually being pulled from their home and entering foster care. And unfortunately, things like that don't stop just because it's Christmas time. And so one of the ways that you can help families that are going to be taking children in over the holidays is to pick up an ornament for them and bring a gift that that family can give to this child during um, just a difficult season, but a beautiful time of year that we can just show and celebrate Jesus. Um, Last in the way of announcements is our regeneration ministry. Last week, Nate did mention substance abuse, and we just wanted to make sure that you, as our church family, were aware of our regeneration meeting that takes place as a part of the Bridge Ministry um, here on Monday nights at 7 o'clock. And that is a meeting that just really meets the needs, encourages, and helps hold accountable those that are struggling with lifelong addictions or um, life-altering just sin and substance abuse. And um, God has done some incredible things. Some of my favorite people at this church are a part of that ministry. And God has just brought so much victory and so many awesome things through Jesus and through the word. And so if that is something that you have struggled with or someone in your life has, we want to let you know that's open to absolutely anyone that could benefit from that here on Monday nights. And maybe if that's not you or your loved ones, would you just join us in praying for that ministry? God has done so much through it, um, but especially at the holidays, you know, it can be a really blessed, joyful time. But it can also be a really bittersweet and difficult time, depending on the things you're walking through. And so would you just pray for that ministry and and pray that God would continue to use it and um, to just really have his hand upon those that are involved in that ministry. That's all I have for announcements for you guys today. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand in the air. One of our ushers will bring one to you. Otherwise, we'll turn it over to Nate for our time in the Word. Thanks, Bree. All right. Good morning, everyone. Hey, let's turn in our Bibles today to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, we're moving verse by verse through uh, the book of Ephesians. If you need a Bible, just shoot your hand in the air so that you can follow along with the teaching. And as you're turning there, I want to say hello to everyone over in Sanctuary 2 this morning and also anyone watching online. And uh, I just wanted to mention, you know, so today we're going to go through the end of Ephesians chapter 5. And, you know, I know it's December and everything, so it might be a question of like, okay, are we going to do like an Advent series or something like that? So I've decided that my Advent series is going to be Ephesians 5 and 6. All right, so that's what we're going to do. And so next today we'll be looking at marriage. Next week we'll be looking at uh, the family or parents and their children and also the workplace. And then the week following, the Sunday before Christmas, we'll be looking at spiritual warfare as we close out the book of Ephesians. And then we'll have a Christmas message, of course, on um, Christmas Eve, if you're able to come out here uh, for that. So just wanted to give you guys the teaching plan for the next uh, few weeks. And again, if you are looking for an outline to be able to follow along with, you can uh, get that at nateholdridge.com. I think we have it on your card there. And I like to post the outline teaching notes for uh, the text that we're going to get into on Sunday morning. So you can check that out uh, there. Uh, But let's go ahead and let's read the text together, Ephesians 5. I want to actually read this whole passage to you and with you. So if you'd follow along with your eyes and your Bible, I'll read the whole thing and then we'll pray and ask for God's help and grace as we get into this. Starting out in verse 22, Paul writing, says, Wives, 
submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And right off the bat, we have to celebrate the fact that we are going verse by verse through the Bible. Uh, <laughs> because uh, the reality is that in my flesh, I probably wouldn't pick this passage as a passage that I'm just randomly going to teach on some Sunday morning. And if I did, you'd probably look at me and think, what's wrong with you? You know, that you might say, like, what, what's your bone to pick? You know, kind of thing. So it's so good to just go verse by verse through the Bible because you're forced to confront the biblical truth, which in actuality, as I hope to show this morning, is so beautiful. All right, so that's how he starts. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband, verse 23, is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of church, of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now verse 25, he points to the husbands and says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives, verse 28, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, verse 31, a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery, verse 32, is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. God, we come to you this morning recognizing that we need your help, Lord, in understanding and then applying your holy word. And Lord, as we hold this book of Ephesians in our hands this morning, and as we're coming to the tail end of it, we pray, Lord, that your vision of the church as an, as an organism with Christ as the head, speaking through the word of God as given with apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, would direct us in our every affair in life, including in marriage and in family and in the workplace. And so, Lord, we pray and ask today as we look at specifically this subject of marriage, we ask, Lord, and pray for the help of your Holy Spirit in understanding and discerning, Lord, what your word has for us in our current day, in our current age, in, in our current situation so lord we pray for that we ask for the help of your holy spirit and i plead with you lord that you would help me by your spirit to be able to communicate lord your truth this morning we thank you lord in jesus name we pray together amen amen i'm going to be honest this last week as i wrestled with this passage of scripture there were a couple of times for me that i got really emotional just thinking about this text. And not just thinking about this text, but specifically, I became really emotional thinking about Christina, my wife, as I was thinking about the truth that's found in this text. I heard a lyric of a song recently where the singer who was addressing his romantic interest, he said, so don't let anyone find you until you found yourself. And as I heard that line and thought about that, I did what I often do with song lyrics, and I asked the question, is that true? Is that biblical? Is that right? Is that, is that good counsel? That, I should, that someone should say, I will not let anyone find me until I've found myself. And I thought about Christina, and I thought about how happy I am. You know, we, we've been blessed. Many people get married when they're out of Christ and then discover Jesus when they're already married, and they become a believer. They come into Christ after marriage. But for Christina and I, we were blessed with that nice grace of God where we had both found Jesus Christ before we were married. 
And not only had we found Christ, and not only had Christ found us before we were married, but we had both adopted into our lives a kingdom priority. We were trying to, as much as we could, apply that statement from Jesus to seek first his kingdom and that all these things would be added unto us. And so when she met me, for instance, I was already pastoring. I was already in ministry. I was already devoting my time and my energy into the things of God. And when when I met her, she was already pursuing the Lord. She was looking for a good, strong, biblical church. She wanted to use her gifts in a local congregation. And so in a sense, when I heard that line, I thought, man, that's so true. It's so good to be found by someone after you've found yourself in Christ Jesus. But on the other hand, I was thinking about that line and I was thinking, but the, the truth is that over these last 16 or 17 years that we've been together, that woman and the marriage that God has given to me and the role that God has given to me as, as, as husband and father and protector and leader and defender, it has been that very role that God has given to me and that very woman that God has given to me that has actually enabled me to find myself. I mean, I've discovered who I am. I've become a realer, truer, more substantial version of Nate Holdridge as a result of being in the relationship that Jesus Christ has designed for me. And as Paul writes this passage of Scripture, he's thinking of marriage, and then as we'll see next week, he's going to think of the family, fathers and children, and then thirdly, he's going to think of the workplace. He's going to use the illustration, because it was happening in the Roman Empire, of slaves and masters, and then finally, he's going to talk about spiritual warfare, and in all of those categories, Paul wants us to become the truest version of our redeemed self. In other words, he looks at the relationships that we're in, the workplaces that we're in, the families that we're in, the marriages that we might find ourselves in, and he sees them as a golden opportunity for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be unleashed in that category of life so that we could become the truest version of who he's called us to be. And so if you're married here today, God has blessed you with that spouse so that you can become the truest version of yourself. But Paul is going to carry this statement or this idea forward into all the different categories uh, of life. So that's a little part of kind of where we're going uh, this morning. Now, like I said, Paul has three categories in mind. He's going to end with that the, the workforce, the workplace, we're going to see that next week. He's also going to talk about the family, and we'll see that next week also in chapter 6, the parents and children. Uh, but he's going to start out today with marriage, and that might help us understand the importance of this particular subject uh, in Paul's mind. Now, when, you have to understand, when, when Paul writes about this as an important subject, first of all, you have to remember, the guy was single. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, He's carried along and inspired by the Spirit to write truth to the church about marriage, yet he is not a married man. And that's important for us, I think, to receive because the reality is that at any given moment, in any given church, it might be that about half of the congregation is living in an unmarried state. Paul himself was married. The great hero of the whole Bible, Jesus Christ, never got married. In fact, the two figures that I think scripturally speak the most powerfully to marriage in our current situation is Jesus and Paul, who were both never married. This is helpful to us because the reality is every single one of us is impacted by the health of marriage in the body of Christ. It might be your marriage, it might be the marriages of others, but every single one of us are either positively or negatively impacted by the health of Christian marriages. And I think every single one of us, whether we are married or unmarried, will have opportunities to speak into and give advice and counsel to Christian marriages. And if you are single here this morning, first of all, you need to know this material, partly for your own life if the Lord ever chooses to put you into a marriage, But secondly, because even in your single state, the Lord will use you from time to time to speak truth into your married friends' lives. And you better know the Bible 
when that moment comes so that you're speaking Bible truth because if you're trying to draw on experiences and stuff like that and you're like, as a, mar- as a single person, I don't have marital experiences to draw from and so I don't know what to say, but the word of God is your authority. So you can stand on that, amen? All right, so you know this is really important, but it's not an all-important thing in the sense of you know every person in the church needs to be married or something like that. It's just this is really important for uh, the body of Christ. So this passage, in this passage, Paul is simply going to, he's going to apply the idea of Jesus being the head of the church. That's what he's been doing in Ephesians. Jesus is the head of the church. He's at the top. He communicates through apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So he communicates to his church through his word. As it's taught, as it's read, as it's understood, he communicates to us. Then, as we've already been studying the last couple of weeks, each individual believer makes a decision that I am going to live out his ethic as he's communicated it in his word in my own life, personally, this new nature that he's given to me. But, Paul's point here is that it's not just for you to live it out in your personal, your personal, private, only you, exclusive relationship with Jesus. His point is, now you have to live it out in every little relationship that you have in life. You see, the thing is, it's easy to put on Christianity for a couple hours each week. But it's much more difficult and much more real to bring your Christianity into your workplace or into your family or into your marriage. It's a much bigger deal to bring it into your everyday relationships that you have in life. And if your Christianity only lasts for a couple of hours on Sunday, but the gospel doesn't follow you home into your everyday experience, then the people that are experiencing you throughout the week, to them, your gospel is not a valuable gospel. What it needs to be is something that penetrates your heart and life and changes you from the inside out so that it comes into any relationship you might find yourself in or family or workplace. So you guys with me about that? All right, so that's where Paul's going. He's gonna say to wives that wives should think about the headship of Jesus over the church and then come under their husbands. Respectfully, and we'll deal with this word, submit to their husbands. And then he's going to think about Jesus as the head of the church, laying down his life for the church, and he's going to say husbands should sacrificially, like Jesus did, love their wives. Okay, so let's read verse uh, 22 to 24 again, just to see this first portion to the wives. He says, verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church his body, and as himself, its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. All right, now the first thing I want to do is actually just think about and deal in a big picture sense this word submit. Uh, It's a word that Paul isn't going to exclusively apply to the wife. He's actually going to use this concept for the children as well in chapter 6, and then for the worker as well in chapter 6. And you can see what's happening here, because in verse 21 that we closed with last week, Paul said that we should submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. And so he's launching from that concept of mutual submission, and he's saying here are three categories where submission should be found. And he goes after it, and he, he talks about three people groups. He talks about wives, he talks about children, and then he talks about workers or slaves. Now, as we think about that, it's fascinating to us. It, it kind of creates almost, maybe for some of you, a tension or a problem. Because as we look out at the world today, and as we look out at the world historically, we recognize that there have, have been times, and that there definitely are times, where women and children and the working class are pushed down that there is uh, uh, almost a system at times designed to hurt and to harm women, children, and the working class. And many of us have celebrated the idea, and, 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 and rightfully so, of seeing, at least to some degree, a liberation of women, and a liberation of children, and a liberation of the working class. And part of the reason that we would do that is because of Jesus. You know, when Jesus came and took on flesh, 
It's been noted before that when he was born, he was not born in a palace, but he was born in a barn. And he was born to a family that was in, for their region and for their time, was basically a middle class or poor family. His dad was a working class man who was a carpenter, his earthly father. And Jesus took that role. He did not grow up in a king's palace. And so we see Jesus, our Lord, in a sense through his life, identifying with those who have not because he set aside, he he could already identify with those who have because he'd come out of glory. Then we also see that Jesus, when he built his ministry team, he, of course, followed the whole f- the, the format that you f- see all throughout the Bible, where God chooses for the primary spiritual leadership amongst his people, he chose men. And when he, when he went up into the mountaintop and he prayed about who his disciples should be, he came down from the mountain and he chose 12 men. And he established these men as his apostles, and those apostles then wrote, and they wrote about pastors and leaders in the church, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers operating many of those roles in a male capacity. But at the same time, as he did all of that, he had a component of his ministry team that was also female, who were following around, and actually many of them were funding his three-and-a-half-year public ministry because they were women of means. And Jesus would do things that were countercultural in his time, like teach Bible studies to women so that they could understand the Word of God, be able to know the Word of God, and apply it into their lives. That was revolutionary in Jesus' day. And then finally, when you think about Jesus with children, he loved children. He lived in an era where in the Greco-Roman society, some people would take their children if they were unwanted, unwanted babies, and they would take them to their local forum or amphitheater and drop them off at night. And some people would come and take those children as their own and adopt them. But before you say, oh, that's sweet, how kind, how generous, many times they were taken in order to become slaves or to enter into the sex trade. That was the kind of culture and environment that Jesus was living in when he said things like, do not prohibit, permit not the children from coming to me. He loved children. He loved hanging out with kids. Some of his best illustrations were about children. He put value on the worker, on the woman, on the child throughout his whole life. So then Paul comes along, and here he goes, saying, wives should submit to their husbands, And children should submit to their parents, particularly here in this passage, their fathers. And workers or slaves should submit to their employers or to their, in that culture and in that environment, very different from our American history, uh, slavery, but they should submit to their masters, is what Paul is going to say when we get to chapter 6. So when Paul says these things, is he at odds with Jesus? Absolutely not. Paul is never at odds with Jesus. He is unpacking what Jesus has taught what Jesus has done. He is not going to respond to those ills that anybody who's looking around can see have existed and do exist. He is not going to look at, around at those ills and say, here's the solution. The solution, when it comes to the, the, the class conflict, workers and masters, is to create a class war. And the solution when it comes to the generations being at odds with each other is to create a generation war. And the solution when it comes to men and women is to create a gender war. Paul isn't going to do any of that. What he's going to say is, look, if you are a wife, if you are a child, if you are a worker, then then you need to embrace that and run to it. And also, he's going to say, if you're a husband... If you're a father, if you are a leader, then you need to run to that with the blood of Jesus all over you. Because there are men who are, are, you know, you know how boys are, you know, I have three daughters, you know, so anytime I get around people that have sons, you know, it's like an education. I just like watching, you know, because in my house it's like there's lots of talking and artwork and music and peacefully reading and, you know, things like that. And, and then when I get around little boys, it's just like there's throwing, there's destruction, there's outbursts of anger and wrath, you know. It's just very obvious that there's this difference between us. 
And, 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 and the temptation, this is what our culture will sometimes try to do, the temptation is to say, so, males, stop being that. Stop being that. Run away from that. But Paul isn't going to say to run away from that. He's going to say run towards the best version of that. That thing in you that feels aggression and feels violence at times, get into your heart a passion for righteousness so that you can become defender, protector. That thing in you that wants to you know, produce and create, let in you the gospel work in your life where you become builder and provider and innovator and leader. That thing in you that wants to teach and communicate and train and you let it become in you a thing where you're cultivating and loving and nurturing and bringing someone up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. So Paul isn't going to say, hey, all these different people be at war with each other. He's going to say, hey, in Christ Jesus, all these different people get to run more completely into who they really could be in Christ Jesus. All right, so that goes for everybody in this whole category. I wanted to read actually a quote from Martin Luther King Jr., who in saying this about the world, I think it's a beautiful quote. When you think about it, this kind of truth that I'm trying to communicate this morning in the church. He said, in a real sense, all of life is interrelated, every human being. All men are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one person directly affects every person indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. And I know of no organism on earth that that is more true than in the body of Christ, than in the church. We are a collection of people. You've got to be the fully redeemed version of you, and I've got to be the fully redeemed version of me, and when you're that and I'm that, we are good, amen? So that's where Paul is taking us with these words like submission. So let's bring it back to looking at the wife. He says a wife is to submit to her own husband uh, as to the Lord. So she's not to submit to every husband. She's not to submit to every man. It doesn't say that. It says a wife is to submit to her own husband as to the Lord. Now, some people have made the error of interpreting this as a wife should submit to her husband as long as he acts just like the Lord. You can imagine who in the marriage might make that that error. (laughs) You know, as long as you act just like Jesus, Jesus wouldn't talk to me like that. Jesus wouldn't make that decision. As long as you act just like Jesus, I'll follow after you. Well, the reality is that your husband, if you're married, is a sinner. And by the way, you are a sinner. I hope that you figured out before the day of your wedding came that he was a sinner And if you didn't, then I'm sure it took like five minutes for you to figure out this man is is flawed. He is not perfect. So he's not saying as long as he acts perfect, then follow him. The other error might be that someone would say that a husband should be submitted to like he is the Lord. You could see who might make that mistake. You know, that, that, that my word is like Scripture. When I say it, let it be written, you know, kind of concept. No, the idea here, a great way to think of this, is that a wife should submit to her husband as a way for her to worship the Lord. Submitting to him as she would submit to the Lord, it's like a way of saying, look, Lord, you know, this thing is where he's going. I don't know. I don't know but it's my way of worshiping you. It's my way of honoring you. It's my way of being devoted to you. It's my way of celebrating the lordship of Jesus Christ over my life. Now notice in verse 23 that he says the husband is the head of the wife. This speaks of a position that the husband has in his wife's life. He is 
her head. Now, when Paul says this, he's borrowing from creation itself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul, in dealing with some issues inside the church, how is the church supposed to function? How is the church supposed to work? Who can do what inside the body of Christ? He goes back to Genesis 2, and he goes back to creation to make his point. And he's doing the same thing here. That by creation, by design, Adam, who came first, was the head of Eve, and by creation, by design, the husband is to be head of his wife. And this is a very difficult concept for us to embrace. Because all the other, if you really think about it, so many of the other leadership roles that we look out on and see throughout planet Earth, they are roles that have been earned, not bestowed. Right? You know, so somebody gets the education. They do the whole thing. They get all the degrees. And so then they get, as a result of going to school, getting that degree, they get to become something. You know, or they've had success, a long line of success. They just, they did this and it worked. They did that and it worked. They did this and it worked. And eventually after promotion, after promotion, after promotion, because it worked, because they had success, they were given more leadership uh, position or a higher leadership role. But that's not the way it is in a marriage. The husband does not go get his master's degree on being a husband. The husband doesn't, you know, after 37 years of success as a husband, he finally gets to be the head. No, it's just given to him. This is not chauvinism that Paul is pointing out. It's creationism. He's just saying this is, this is how God designed. This is how God created us to work. So he says, verse 24, she must submit in everything to her husband uh, in the same way that the church is supposed to submit to everything uh, that the Lord desires for their life. All right, now I should say in all of this that when Paul is saying these things, it's so clear, I mean, what, what's so clear is that he does not see tyranny at all. In fact, what he sees in humanity is tyranny, and he's trying to violently destroy tyranny. So he's talking to the husbands and talking to the fathers and talking to the masters who oftentimes create tyranny. So in his, whole, in his mindset, there is, there is nothing in Paul's mind where he's thinking, yeah, you know, this is like some kind of thing that a Christian man could take home to bully his wife or to abuse his wife with. His exhortation isn't, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, boss around your wives. No, his exhortation is, husbands, love your wife. This is his way of destroying tyranny, not creating it. So, what then does this mean for a Christian wife? Well, as I've thought about all this, you know, especially the concept that Paul is making that the church comes under Jesus and the wife is to come under her husband, Here's a definition for a marital submission. And again, I put this in my notes, my notes online. I, I wrote it like this. The wife makes a choice. It is a choice. The wife makes a choice to place herself as an equal underneath another equal, her husband. She comes under his lead just like the church is supposed to come under the lead of Christ for the effectiveness of the marriage and the family. You know, when you really think about what Paul's saying, he's saying the church is supposed to be under the headship of Jesus. Now, now wives aren't supposed to look around at the church and say, well, sometimes the church is not really good at that, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just follow the church's lead. You know, the idea is that, that the church works best when it's connected to Jesus' mission and heart and passion. And when it comes under his mission, the church works best. Right? You guys follow me? When we, when we individually say, no, I got my mission, I got my thing, I'm not about Jesus' mission, the church is dysfunctional, we're odd, and we're not, we're not fruitful. But when we're connected to Jesus and his mission and his heart, we're effective. This helps us understand what Paul's seeing for the, for the marriage. He's, he's seeing partly that when a woman says, man, I'm going to connect to his vision, his heart, his passion, so that we can be effective 
so that we can be fruitful as a family. It's part of what he's saying, but then part of what he seems to be saying is, and when a husband gets Jesus' vision inside his heart, mind, soul, and bones, that's when he's worthy of you know, following after, and so she follows him who's following Jesus, and everything works great when that is what is flowing in a Christian marriage. All right, so that's the first section, wives submitting to their husbands. So uh, in verse 25, Paul gets after the husbands. Uh, he says, husbands, let's read it together, verse 25, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Her. Uh, the word love there is the word agape. Uh, the, the word agape in the Greek language speaks of a love that seeks always for the highest good of the person that is the target of that love. So you, if you really think about what Paul is saying, it's like he's saying to husbands, husbands, agape your wife. You know, seek for her highest good all the time. And then it's like he pauses and thinks, if only I had an illustration of someone who has done that, and the illustration he comes out with is Jesus, who laid down his life for his church. So what you, what you gotta see right away is that Paul, in his mind, he is not preaching about some sappy, sentimental, you know, purely romantic, emotional kind of love. He, he's not just saying, Oh, husband, love your wife, remember to buy her flowers. You know, or oh, husband, love your wife, remember your anniversary. He's saying, husband, love your wife, remember to die. That's what he's saying. Remember to die for her. And, and if dying for her means buying her flowers and remembering your anniversary, then do that. But don't just do that. Make sure that you are living out a love where you are dying for your bride. This last week I was reading in my quiet time in Isaiah chapter 53, which is a prophecy about Jesus' death. These are some of the words found about his death in Isaiah 53. He was despised. He was rejected. He was acquainted with sorrows and grief. He was stricken. He was smitten by God. He was afflicted. He was wounded. He was chastised. He was oppressed. He was cut off. And he was crushed, and he did all of those things for his bride. Christian men are to love their wives in that sacrificial kind of sense where they say, I will die for you. And not just that like proverbial, you know, if a train is coming down the tracks and it's you or me, babe, I'll push you out of the way and I will die for you then. But your wife is looking at you going, but can you set down the remote control for a second and love me like that you know it's a daily kind of death it's a servant kind of kind of death so how can how can christian men sacrificially in a dying kind of way love their wives like christ loved the church well think about what jesus did for the church i'm going to give you five things real quickly if you're taking notes you can write these things down number one jesus got uncomfortable for his bride and what I mean by that is that he was in glory eternally and he stepped out of glory. So he set aside his comfort and he became uncomfortable for his bride, uncomfortable for us. And there will be times where Christian husbands are called to become uncomfortable for their wives. They're going to be called to give up their toys, give up their hobbies, give up their time, their energy, their own interests or man way of doing things and become uncomfortable to sacrifice, to lay down their life. Number two, Jesus incarnated for his bride. He not only came out of glory, but he became human. He took on humanity. We're celebrating that during Christmas. By the way, isn't that beautiful? I just love it, you know. To me, it's just so sweet. I know a lot of people at season's greetings and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Happy holidays, you know. But almost like when people just talk about it like that, it makes it even all the sweeter when someone says Merry Christmas. You know, it's just beautiful to hear. Like, that's what it's about, you know. And to, to think about the fact of his incarnation. So a husband can love his wife by incarnating for her. Now, what that does not mean, of course, is that you are somehow going to become a woman. 
Uh, that is not possible. You will not become a woman. But Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, that husbands should dwell with their wives in an understanding way. In other words, you are to be constantly, if you're a Christian husband, learning and discovering and studying and thinking about and trying to figure out what is it that makes this woman tick? What is she like? What drives her? What are her passions? What is she learning? What is she thinking about? You are trying to understand your wife. You know, I, I have, Christina and I, we have a vision, you know, for our life and for our marriage that if the Lord tarries, doesn't return for us, you know, earlier on in our life, and should death not take us, you know, we would love to be married for 50 or 60 years. You know, we were 20 four years old when we got married. So we're, we're hoping for a long life of marriage together. And the reality is that if we get to a place at the end of our lives, if we're, if we're, if we're both still ticking, and we're sitting there 60 years into our marriage, the reality, you know, some people would think like, well, you've just, you know, 60 years, you've just been married to the same old person for 60 years. But well, my, my thought on it is, there, 60 years with one woman, that's, that's not one marriage, that's like 20 marriages. <laughs> you know, because the reality is that Christina is not going to be at 84 years old who she was at 24 years old, and neither am I. And so every year that goes by, every, every decade that goes by, every season of life that goes by, man, i got to incarnate to try to more in that season figure out who is this person? What drives her? What's going on with her heart and life? Jesus also, number three, was patient with his wife. He was patient. He looked at those disciples just like he looked at you on the first day of your salvation, and he saw the mess and all that, forgave it, but then had a vision for your future glory and a vision for their future glory. The reality is we must be patient with our wives. They are not yet who they will become in Christ Jesus. They, like you, are growing. And so to be patient with that growth and development. Number four, Jesus spent time with his disciples. You have to spend time with your bride. You know, we try to, to, to discover how to disciple people in our modern environment, and so often we want to try to create these discipleship programs where with one hour a week for 12 weeks a disciple is made, but Jesus spent three years living with his disciples. That's time. You have to, if you're going to love your bride, you've got to give her some time. You've got to spend time just sitting and being and experiencing each other. And then finally, Jesus, number five, loved his bride by dying for his bride. He died. And the reality is that life is not easy. Life is filled with sickness. Life is filled with wayward children. Life is filled with miscarriages. Life is filled with sin and mistakes and regrets. Life is filled with mental illness. Life is filled with all of these things. And the Christian husband rolls up his sleeves and says, I know all that is coming, but I am going to go through all that with this woman and not apart from this woman. And so there are times that we die. Now Paul goes on to talk about this husband love by saying in verse 26 that he must sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word by the way we've seen the two big exhortations submit and love now he's coloring uh, that second exhortation of love in so let's see what he says he says that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water by the word this is what jesus has done so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish in the same way husbands should love their wives so paul thinking about jesus laying down his life for the church he gives all these words to describe what jesus does for the church it's a cool study in and of and by itself you know he washes his church with the water of the word he, he 
got the Bible written for us. He gives us all these word-based gifts so that we can understand His Word. He washes us with it. He's sanctifying us, you know, by His Spirit. Like, He's patient. He's growing us. He's changing us. He's, he's helping us develop more and more to who we're supposed to be in Christ Jesus. He's going through all that. He's nurturing us. He's, he's cleansing us. But notice the goal, verse 27. Jesus has a goal for His church. So that, verse 27, He might present the church to himself in splendor. The whole thing of Jesus' love for the church is that he has a vision. He has a mission in mind. And the mission is the church will be beautiful. And that's a question that every Christian husband has to ask. Do I have a vision and do I have a game plan like Jesus does to make his wife beautiful? Do I have a vision to do things that lead to the beautification of my bride. You know, on your wedding day, your bride beautifies herself for you. But your whole marriage should be spent with you trying to do what you can to beautify her. So, you know, you pray. You pray with her, and you pray for her, and you even pray about her. You know, Lord, man, I gotta go on a walk right now, and I gotta pray about this woman that you've gave gave me. I gotta I gotta understand like where's she coming from, what's she thinking, what, what's going on within her heart. You get into the word with her. You discuss podcasts you're listening to, or Bible verses that you you have just read that minister to you, or sermons. You go out to lunch on Sunday afternoon and you talk about how great the sermon was and you, you know, try to apply it into your life and experience. You love her with that game plan for her glory by walking with God personally, getting into his word. Christina has told me before that one of the things that makes her feel most safe is that she knows that I will start each morning with my Bible open talking to God, praying, letting him speak to me. That's a comfort to a wife who has said, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to submit to you. It's a comfort to know that God has my address or God has your address to be able to change your heart, to change your mind, to correct you, to chasten you. And you have a goal for her glory by using your words. Not to tear down, not to ridicule, not to say, I don't know what's wrong with you, but to say, I love you and to encourage her. You know, in the Song of Solomon, you see in that marriage, in the book of Song of Solomon, you see that this woman came into her marriage with Solomon a basket full of insecurity. That's what she was. My skin has been darkened by working in the sun. I'm part of the working class. I'm a mess. My brothers have despised me. My parent put, parents put me out in the field. I had a bad childhood, bad relationship with my siblings. I think lowly of myself. And the whole song is this husband praising her and celebrating her and building her up, not just one time, but sequentially over the years with his words. He had a vision that she would be beautiful. Jesus has that vision for us, and Christian husbands should have that vision for their wives. And then, notice at the end of verse 28, Paul goes on to say, and loving them as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. And then he quotes from Genesis 2, verse 24, the Adam and Eve passage, where he says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So Paul does this cool thing here. He says he's trying to tell husbands, you know, you need to love your wife like Christ loved the church, sacrificially love your, your wife. And one of the reasons that he's saying you should is because you're actually one with her. You're like one body with her. Go back to Genesis 2. He says, you know, the two became one flesh. And, and Adam and Eve, man, their marriage was a trip, if you really think about it. Because it started at the top. I mean, in the Garden of Eden, everything was perfect. Adam had a job. That's good. <laughs> you know, he's working. They're walking with God. And then the first moment, though, that their order became reversed and Adam followed her 
He took the fruit. He's to blame for it. He took the fruit. He ate it. He followed her suggestion. When that happened, sin entered into their lives, their bodies, their minds and hearts, entered into the world. God had said, in the day you eat it, you will surely die. Death entered in to the planet, the galaxy, as a result of that sin. And then, because they were, leaving, because they were living in pre-flood conditions, they lived very long lives. It tells us in Genesis chapter 5 that Adam lived to be over 900 years old. So what that means is that Adam and Eve started off on top, had this catastrophic event enter into their marriage, and then they had to live for 900 years together after that. So we celebrate, you know, when sometimes in church, like how many of you have been married 25 years, and how many of you 40 years, and how many of you 50 years, and we celebrate that. How many of you have been married 900 years? I mean, if you don't figure out how to deal with your history... You don't know, if you don't learn how to forgive and you don't realize that you're one, you, you can't make it. And so he goes back to that first marriage and he points out that, this is so cool, I want you to get this. Adam was here, Eve was here. Eve did not become Adam and Adam did not become Eve. But they ceased to be and they became one. They became a new thing. I've been trying to learn more about this in my own marriage to Christina because, you know, the reality is she's an incredible woman. And she has made that decision as a full-on equal to me. There's, there's no inequality with us. She has made that choice and decision to follow my lead. And, you know, the reality is when she moved down here from San Jose and she started going to Cal State University, Monterey Bay, and then she started doing the church shopping thing and she loved, you know, that this church was teaching through the Bible. And when she found this fellowship and I met her in the college ministry that I was leading at the time and as our friendship developed and we eventually fell in love, you know, the reality is, is that when we got married, you know, she, ado- she took my name, she took my church, my church family, my spiritual family, She took my hometown, my community. She just said, like, I'm going to let all of that, that's going to become me. That's going to become mine. But the truth of the matter is not that with Nate and Christina, the two became one. Christina became Nate. No, it's we became a new one. And I've just been praying and thinking about and and trying to more deeply connect with. I mean, I've, I've always had this to a degree. But just recently, in a fresh way, I've just been thinking about who is she? Because obviously, you know, it's like when when people know us, it's like Nate's up there on the platform all the time, and he's teaching the Bible all the time, and he's a guy that's very public and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is that I'm shifting to her too. And I'm trying to learn what makes her tick and what drives her and what her passions and dreams are, and it has shaped me. I believe that I am a better communicator, a better teacher, a better man, and a better pastor because I left myself, I left my father, I left my mother, and I became a new one with her. And Christian husbands, man, we want to try to figure that out. How does that oneness impact you know, who I am? Not taking her for granted, but thinking on what she has brought into this relationship to change you and who you are. All right, now let's close with verse 32 and 33. Paul says, This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Some Bible translations, when it says verse 32 about the mystery being profound, the way they interpret it is that Paul is saying, Hey, yo, this whole marriage thing, it's it's wild. I don't understand it. Uh, But it seems that he's saying something deeper than that. It seems that what he's saying is Christian marriage, this thing that he just described, Christian marriage is a big old prophecy about this thing that used to be a mystery but is now known on this side of the cross that Christ would come and create spiritual union between himself and his people. So then Paul recaps and just says, so Husbands, you let each one of you, think about your own self, don't think about your spouse, let each one of you, husbands, love your wives, wives, respect your husbands. 
remember Pastor Jeff asked me one time, I think it was up here on a stage, we were doing a marriage conference or something, and Christina and I we were sitting together, and he asked me the question. I didn't know he was going to ask me, but he said, so Nate, how many times through your marriage have you told Christina, you know, you just need to submit to me? So it's kind of an awkward moment. Everyone's waiting, you know. <laughs> you know, and I was like, it's my favorite verse. I say it every day. No, <laughs> not that. You know, I just started thinking about that. It's more that in our marriage, it's the general mood of the marriage, the general tone of the marriage. And I think there's been one or maybe two times in our marriage where after much discussion, after much prayer, after much counsel, hearing from the Lord, hearing from others, getting into his word, we've come to an impasse where we did not know what to do. And in those moments, she's looked at me and said, well, it seems like the Bible then is saying that you need to make the call. Uh, and she doesn't say it with that tone. It's very sweet and gentle. And kind of, I was like, that came out wrong. You know, it's, <laughs> it was very kind and gentle, but it's just, you know, that's my role. So this, isn't, this is a beautiful pattern that God in Christ has given to us. And in these final verses, Paul seems to be saying, look, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that whether you're married or unmarried, there's a better marriage out there. Don't commit the sin of relationship idolatry thinking that someone someday will satisfy you or that your spouse right now will be the one to ultimately satisfy you. That's not true. Paul is saying there's a better marriage between Jesus and his church. That is really the only union that can truly satisfy your heart. And so that's where Paul is driving us uh, as a people. So, man, I just love the Bible. It's incredible. You know, we live in this world and culture that's wrestling with things like male dominance and the patriarchy and all that, and Paul's just like, let's get after it. Let's think about it. Let's think about what God has to say to his people. All right, so I'm going to close in prayer, and the ushers are going to uh, distribute the bread and the cup, and we're going to close by celebrating communion, which is a way for us to celebrate our spiritual union with Jesus. Father, we thank you this morning for your grace and your mercy and your love and your kindness. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've made a way for us to be unified to you. We want to drink in that marriage that we have with you, that union that we have with you. And now, Lord, as we approach your table, we pray, Lord, that you would comfort us and encourage us, that you'd revive us, that you'd forgive us of sin, that you'd heal us, Lord, and that we would, in, in a new sense, partake of this beautiful message that you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, again, the ushers will dispense or disperse the uh, bread and the cup and just hold them in your hands and we'll eat them together and drink them together in a couple minutes after we sing.
we come to you this morning with the bread and the cup in our hands thank you as we hold the bread in our hands that you became one of us you understand our weakness you've felt and lived humanity and Lord we also thank you for your blood your death your laying down your life for us we bring to you, Lord, all of our sin, our rebellion, even, Lord, in this last week, things that were out of step with you. Forgive us, God. Wash us. Purify us. Cleanse us, and Lord, in, in a sense, give us a, a little mini revival right now. Revive these hearts of ours, Lord. But thank you for what you've given to us in Christ Jesus. We rejoice in you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. Together, church. I want to close today by just simply praying for you, if you'd let me. Father, I pray for your people, and I ask, Lord, for your great hand of grace and mercy to be thick upon their lives this week. Father, for every person that finds himself in a married state right now, give them grace, Lord, for their spouse, for their marriage for their walk with and in you. And Father, for every one of us, we pray, Lord, that you'd help us, that your face would shine upon us. And Lord, that you would bless us indeed. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you, church. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week.